Okay, I think we have gone six o'clock, so let's be official about it. <laughs> All right, welcome everybody. Um, really nice to see so many of you joining us this evening, and I'm sure there'll be a few more joining us over the next few minutes. So whilst that happens, I'm just going to do a few introductions and a little bit of housekeeping, um, digital housekeeping that is. So um, I'm Gail Chapman. I'm uh, the Public Programs Officer here at the Royal College of Physicians. I use here uh, virtually. <laughs> um, the Royal College of Physicians Museum and along the bottom of the screen you should be able to see four cameras myself Larry Jones our senior curator who is having a little bit of technical trouble this evening so might only be able to join in on the chat um, of course our star of the evening Wendy Moore who will be uh, going into her talk very soon um, and Katie Burkwood, our rare books librarian, who's going to be giving us a little bit of an introduction to the museum and will be here at the end as well for any questions. Uh, I'm going to hand over now to our rare books librarian, Katie Burkwood, who's going to give us a brief introduction to the museum and our exhibition, RCP Unseen, uh, and then we will get into the main event with Wendy Moore. Lovely. Thanks very much, Gail. Um, so, good evening, everyone, and welcome to the talk. Thanks for joining us this evening. I know it's going to be a really fantastic talk tonight, Endell Street, the women who ran Britain's trailblazing military hospital. But before we dive into that, just a little bit of background about the Royal College of Physicians and our museum and what we do. For those of you who aren't familiar, the Royal College of Physicians is a medical charity which represents 38,000 doctors worldwide. The core mission of the charity is to improve patient health and to reduce illness. And as well as being a modern healthcare charity working to raise standards and support the medical workforce, we're also an organisation with 500 years of history. This history is looked after by an archive, historical library and museum team, um, which Gail, myself and Larry all work in. And we care for a huge range of collections, rare books, artwork, medical instruments, silverware, letters and manuscripts. They all represent the history of the Royal College of Physicians and of the history of medicine more widely. In normal times, which obviously we're not in at the moment, these collections are all available for research on site in London and they're displayed, displayed around our building, which is just next to Regent's Park. Um, they're used in an active exhibition and events programme and currently we are using them actively in our online programme, which tonight is part of. Now our current exhibition is RCP Unseen which is an online exhibition and it's an opportunity for us to display items that we've never had the chance to show you before and to show some of the ways in which our collections are used when they're not on display to tell stories which haven't been previously told um, and this point is the most relevant for this evening medical history is traditionally told as the achievements of men women however have been active in medicine for centuries in various ways but their stories haven't often been told um, and before we get on to the women of Endell Street um, I'll just show you this is a little taster of what you can see in the online exhibition um, we'll be sharing the link to that with you and you can find it on our website and do dive in and one of the stories there you'll see is um, a project that I've been closely involved with that I'm just going to give a tiny plug to before we get on to Wendy's work it's a research project being undertaken by Catherine James who's doing a PhD research project on our rare books to look for evidence of how women have used them over um, several centuries of history, particularly in the Tudor and Stuart periods of English history. So she's been going through all of our rare books one by one to look for evidence of women writing their names in them. Um, it's an amazing project. She's made some amazing finds already, one of which is included in RCP Unseen. Um, and we're really looking forward to seeing what else she discovers and reading her published research in due course. But enough of that. We're really thrilled to have Wendy Moore with us this evening. Wendy is a freelance journalist and best-selling author of five non-fiction books on medical and social history, including The Knife Man, which has already been mentioned in the comments, and Wedlock. Her new book, Endell Street, The Women Who Ran Britain's Trailblazing Military Hospital, has been a BBC Radio 4 book of the week and is available to buy now. Um, we'll have links for you. Um, in the chat as well um, and Wendy was just telling us before we got started that as well as the hardback being out now the paperback um, editions are going to be available soon um, and she's got tasters to on her desk at the moment which is very exciting. Um, Wendy thank you for joining us and we'll hand over to you now. Okay <clears throat> so thank you very much indeed to Gail and to Katie and Larry for organising the event. Um, it's a, a pleasure to join you all thank you very much indeed for coming. 
it's a shame, of course, that we can't be here tonight in the magnificent Royal College of Physicians building that's in Regent's Park. But on the plus side, of course, we don't have to all struggle home through the cold and wet, and you can help yourself to as many refreshments as you would like. So um, let me see if I can. OK, there we go. So I'm going to talk for about 30 minutes about the story of Endor Street Military Hospital and how I came to write it. And then I'm happy to answer questions. We are of course, living through extraordinary times at the moment. And the story that I'm going to talk about, I think has got many parallels for us today. I'm a journalist by training, and what I look for when I'm writing books is um, a great story to tell that hasn't been told before from medical and social history. And so often when I talk about my books, people want to know, how did I first come across the story? What was the inspiration for the books? And usually the answer is quite dull. There's not any eureka moment. But with my current book, Endor Street, there really was a dramatic moment of discovery. Because a few years ago, I walked into the Welcome Library for the History of Medicine in Euston Road, and I saw a painting on the wall, and it's this painting. And I did a double take. It's a huge, beautiful painting. Um, and some of you may have actually seen it um, quite recently because it was displayed at the Royal College of Physicians two years ago as part of their exhibition on women in medicine, uh, which was called This Vexed Question. Um, and if you saw it then, you will have been impressed by just the size and the, the sheer loveliness of it. Um, unfortunately, normally it's kept in the basement of the uh, Imperial War Museum, uh, so not seen at all. So it's rare enough today to see an operating theatre where all of the doctors are female. Currently, women make up 48% uh, of the um, of doctors in the UK, and we're actually at the tipping point where very soon it's possible women may um, be doctors in equal numbers or even in a majority, but they are still underrepresented in many areas, including surgery. Currently, 88% of surgeons are male. And then I discovered that this picture depicts an operating theatre in the First World War in a hospital that was run and staffed almost entirely by women. Endor Street Military Hospital. And I was amazed to find out that the hospital wasn't better known. And so I began a journey to find out more about it and uh, bring that story to life. Endor Street was unique. It was the only military hospital under the auspices of the British Army to be run and staffed by women. It was set up by two women doctors and all of its medical staff were female. Throughout the First World War, the women at, at Endor Street treated wounded men sent back from the front line, from France, from Gallipoli, from every war zone. And the story of how the hospital came about is a remarkable example of courage, determination and stamina, which I think still speaks volumes to us today. Well, when war broke out in August 1914, thousands of men signed up to fight and women signed up in their thousands too, as volunteers in every capacity. So women worked on the land, in factories and on public transport, like this conductorette, as she was known, on a bus in the Strand. And of course, women doctors volunteered too. Within 10 days of war being declared, more than 60 women doctors had put their names forward to the war office, but their help was bluntly rejected. One doctor, a Scottish surgeon who was named Elsie Ingalls, she volunteered her services to the army and she was rebuffed with the words which have become quite well known, my good lady, go home and sit still. 
Well, Flora Murray and Louisa Garrett Anderson refused to sit still. They were both qualified doctors with more than 10 years experience each. Louisa, who was 41, was a surgeon. Flora, who was four years older, was a physician and anaesthetist. They had both originally trained at the London School of Medicine for Women, although Flora finished her medical education at Durham University. But despite the fact that their qualifications were exactly identical to their male colleagues, as women doctors, they were only allowed to treat women and children. So women in the UK had won the right to qualify in medicine several decades earlier. And in fact, it was Louisa's mother, Elizabeth Garrett Anderson, who had become the first woman to qualify in Britain to join the medical register in 1865. And yet nearly 50 years later, at the start of the First World War, women doctors were still confined to treating women and children. So by this point, there were roughly 1,000 women doctors, and the vast majority of them had qualified, like Flora and Louisa, at the London School of Medicine for Women, for the simple reason that most medical schools and all those in London did not admit women students. Women were effectively barred from posts in the big mainstream hospitals because the boards always gave the posts to men. And interestingly, the Royal Colleges, like the Royal College of Physicians and the Royal College of Surgeons, did not admit women. Um, so women could not take their higher qualifications, which would allow them to do more senior posts. And it was taboo for um, for women doctors to treat men, although, of course, nurses were treating men all the time and women rarely worked in surgery. So Flora Murray and Louisa Garrett Anderson had no choice but to work in hospitals run by women to treat women and children. Louisa worked as a surgeon at the New Hospital for Women, which had been originally founded by her mother. So that later became known as the Elizabeth Garrett Anderson Hospital, uh, which was quite famous in its time, um, but was eventually subsumed into University College Hospital, UCH. Flora worked in small hospitals in South London for women and children. And together they ran a small hospital for children. Um, it only had seven beds, in fact, in a poor area of West London. Uh, so the picture on the left shows Flora in the middle there, if you can see her, hopefully, if I'm not blocking your view, in the very crowded outpatients department. So given the prejudice that they faced, it's hardly surprising that they had both become suffragettes. Louisa had served four weeks in Holloway Prison for smashing a window in a mass protest. Um, you can actually see her in a suffragette um, march. She's actually marching to Downing Street with her mother in that photograph. And Flora had taken really what was even more daring action. She had been Emmeline Panker's doctor and campaigned vociferously against the force feeding of suffragettes on hunger strike, which was actually being overseen by prison doctors. She treated many suffragettes for the ill effects of force feeding at a nursing home that she ran. And she even, it seems, helped some of these suffragettes to evade police arrest when they were due to go back to prison. Um, so really, they were both putting their uh, rep reputations, their professional reputations on the line. In fact, in early 1914, just a few months before the war broke out, Flora was under surveillance by Scotland Yard for her activities. They were also life partners. Flora and Louisa were completely devoted to each other. They wore identical diamond rings and they lived together in the manner of a married couple. Flora described Louisa as my loving comrade. So they had stood shoulder to shoulder in the women's battle for equality. But when the war broke out, the suffragettes and the suffragists but all suspended their campaign for the vote so they could join the fight against the common enemy. So although a few did become pacifists, most former suffragettes and suffragists now threw their energies into supporting the war effort. 
Well, Flora Murray and Louisa Garrett Anderson were just as keen as any male doctor to serve their country and to help the wounded. But they also saw the war as an opportunity. It was a chance to gain the vital medical experience that they had been so far denied. And most importantly, to prove that women doctors were equal to their male colleagues. So they didn't waste time approaching the British Army. They knew they would be rejected. As active suffragettes, they were effectively public enemies. Instead, just eight days after the outbreak of the war, they offered their help to the French Red Cross, who were more than happy to accept. And within a fortnight, they had raised £2,000 for medical supplies. They had recruited a team of like-minded women and kitted them all out with military style uniforms. And then on the 15th of September, just six weeks after the start of the war, they set off with their team for France. So they were actually the first women's medical unit to go abroad. So they named their unit the Women's Hospital Corps. And in addition to Murray and Anderson, the Corps comprised three women doctors and later on two more joined them, eight nurses and also more nurses came out later, and three women orderlies. Plus they had four male helpers who were, who were male nurses. And when they arrived in Paris, they were given an empty luxury hotel the Hotel Claridge in the Champs-Élysées. It was brand new, never actually opened. And within 48 hours, they had scrubbed the floors, set up camp beds and converted the hospital into a 100 bed emergency. So converted the hotel into a 100 bed emergency hospital. So they turned the hotel's stylish salons and dining rooms on the ground floor into the wards. The ladies' cloakroom was converted into the operating theatre, and you can see them in the picture on the right. And the grill room, elegant grill room, which had been designed so that um, guests could linger over steak and claret, that was turned into the mortuary. And then just two days after they moved into carriages, the wounded began pouring in. They were mostly British and French soldiers from the front line, which was at that point roughly 60 miles north of Paris, mostly wounded at the Battle of the Arne. And most of them needed urgent surgery. So as women doctors, they were, of course, extremely, even dangerously inexperienced. They had no experience of military surgery. They had very little experience of major surgery at all and they had never previously treated men. But they learned fast, and in any case, the wounds and conditions that they now faced were unprecedented. So no doctors, male or female, had previously encountered the scale of casualties and the extent of wounds that the First World War unleashed. So the men that came to them had huge, gaping, ragged wounds, they had complex compound fractures where the broken bone actually breaks through the skin. They had wounds from shrapnel, which had left dozens of fragments in muscles and bones. And there were many men with head injuries in the early years of the war before it occurred to somebody at the war office that it might be quite a good idea if the men wore steel helmets. And there were um, uh, early cases of shell shock. And even, even worse, most of the wounds had extensive gangrene, which was caused by the microbes in the heavily manured soil of northern France. Well, to begin with, um, army officers and army doctors who came to visit the, the hospital in order to see this novelty of a military hospital staffed by women were hostile. But they toured the hospital, they spoke to the patients, and they uh, watched the women in the operating theatre, and they were quickly converted and actually became strong allies and advocates for the women's work. So two months later, in November 1914, Flora and Louisa opened a second hospital in a small hotel, the Chateau Mauricienne 
at Wimmerur, about four miles north of, Bolo of Boulogne. And this time the army gave them official status. So the Chateau Mauricienne became the first hospital staffed by women to operate under army auspices. And there they treated uh, wounded from the first battle of Ypres who were arrived in Boulogne daily in ambulance trains. And then in early 1915, Murray and Anderson were invited to a meeting at the War Office in London with Sir Alfred Keogh, the head of the Royal Army Medical Corps. So Keogh had heard about their work in France, heard it praised by army chiefs there. He knew he needed thousands more beds on the home front in Britain to treat the wounded. And so he now asked them to run a major military hospital in the heart of London. And it was an astonishing request, quite unprecedented. And they accepted immediately. They knew that this was their real chance to prove that women doctors were every bit as skilled as their male colleagues. So they closed their units in France and they moved back to London. While well, Ender Street Military Hospital opened in May 1915 in a former workhouse, St Giles and St George's Workhouse in Covent Garden. It had 520 beds and that was later increased to 573 in 17 wards. And all the wards were named after female saints. And it was and it would remain the only hospital within the British Army to be run and staffed by women. So apart from 22 male Royal Army Medical Corps orderlies, and that number was later reduced to eight, all of its 180 staff were female. So there were 14 doctors, and that's 14 doctors posts. In fact, altogether, there were about 14 different women doctors who worked at End of Street throughout the war, including surgeons, physicians, anaesthetists, radiologists, a pathologist, an ophthalmologist and a dental surgeon. All of them without exception had trained at the London School of Medicine for Women. Flora Murray was the chief physician. So she was essentially doctor, she was doctor in charge. She was essentially running the hospital. And Louisa Garrett Anderson was the chief surgeon. There were also 29 trained nurses. So not very many really for 17 wards and more than 80 orderlies. And in fact, it was the orderlies who did most of the work. They were nursing assistants. Some of them were um, became effectively nurses and were sometimes left in charge of wards overnight. They were stretcher bearers. They were the cooks. They were the cleaners. They were the clerks. And many of those orderlies were young, middle or upper class women who had previously led lives of leisure. Most of them had never previously boiled an egg, let alone changed, um, emptied a bedpan. And some of them were dropped off in the morning at the gates of Endel Street in cars driven by chauffeurs. But regardless of their background, all of the women wore the same Endel Street uniform. They were, um, they were awarded army pay and allowances, and they were given honorary military rank. So Murray and Anderson became the equivalent of majors and later on Murray was promoted to become lieutenant colonel. But they were not allowed official commissions or to wear army uniform or army insignia. Andrew Street was on the front line of the capital's wartime medical care. So altogether, ultimately, there would be more than 300 hospitals of varying sizes in London receiving wounded soldiers. But they range from um, the very big general hospitals like um, Guy's and the Lond Royal London to tiny nursing homes um, which received officers. So out of those, Endra Street was one of the 20 biggest military hospitals in the capital. And within central London, it was one of the biggest 10. And because of its proximity to Charing Cross Station, it received the most serious cases. So the convoys of wounded, like the one you can see in the picture, usually arrived in the middle of the night. And the imminent arrival of an ambulance was announced by a bell ringing in the courtyard. 
And at that moment, then the orderlies on duty who were um, living in the hospital, they'd have to hurriedly get dressed and run down to stand to attention in the courtyard. And then up to 80 men would be unloaded from the ambulances at a time. Well, Entra Street was really regarded as a huge gamble. When Sir Alfred Keogh came up with his plan, he was actually warned by his colleagues that it would be a failure. So army chiefs told him it would not last six months. And in fact, the war office put every obstacle in the women's way. They were as unhelpful as possible. And yet it not only survived six months, it was hailed a triumph. To begin with, some of the wounded men who were unloaded from those ambulances uh, in that courtyard, they were so shocked at being surrounded by women and being treated by women doctors, they thought they had been sent there to die because that was the only explanation they could think of for being sent to a hospital run by women. But they not only very quickly accepted the women staff, but they started telling their friends and journalists that this was the best hospital in London. And the newspapers responded likewise. To begin with, the press really treated Ender Street as a bit of a curiosity, and the early press reports were often frivolous or even incredulous. But that soon changed, and then Ender Street was uh, frequently featured in the newspapers, um, being held up as a, an emblem of the blighty fighting spirit. And the Suffragettes Hospital, as it was known, was described in headlines as the most popular and the most successful in London. So Enter Street became renowned for its efficient organisation and professional medical care. Throughout the war, the staff treated more than 26,000 wounded, and the vast, vast majority of them were men, but there were about 2,000 women who were also treated there, who were um, enrolled in the the the, rap, the wax and the wen the wrens and the rafts in the early uh, later years of the war, who'd actually been sent to near the front line. There were also many more outpatients, and through the war, the doctors at Ender Street performed more than seven thousand major operations many more minor operations as well. And they were often operating for up to eight or nine hours a day. And they introduced pioneering treatments. They were in the vanguard in championing x-rays and physiotherapy and occupational therapy, all of which were quite novel specialties at the uh, outbreak of the war. And they also pioneered a, not a new method of wound treatment. In 1916, Louisa Garrett Anderson and the Endel Street pathologist, Helen Chambers, they trialled a new antiseptic ointment to try to tackle the severely infected wounds that they saw. The ointment was called bismuth iodoform paraffin paste, or BIP for short. And they found that it not only healed wounds better than other antiseptics, but because it was a paste, it could be left in place for up to 10 days. So that meant it needed much fewer dressings, which was far less painful for the men and less time consuming for the staff. So they first tested BIP in July 1916 on some of the, the first men, wounded men, sent back from the Somme advance. And they published their results in The Lancet a few months later. But as well as being renowned for its professional medical treatment, Endel Street was famous for its homely atmosphere and its caring approach. So Louisa Garrett Anderson believed that many of the men were more wounded in their minds than in their bodies. And so she insisted that all the wards should be airy and bright and colourful. So they had colourful bed quilts, they had standard lamps, there were fresh flowers brought in every day. The courtyard, which had been this very grim exercise yard in the original workhouse, was transformed into a tranquil green haven with plants and striped umbrellas. 
um, and that was where the men could relax or enjoy entertainments like the bank holiday fete that you can see in the, the photograph. And on those occasions, sometimes the men were invited to bring their families as well. So that's why there's a, a little girl at the front of that picture. There was also a library with 5,000 books, which was run by two women authors and a theater, which stayed hun staged hundreds of entertainments, including concerts, magic acts, and pantomimes. There was an annual Christmas pantomime, which was quite an event. They had altogether more than a thousand entertainers visiting every year. So it was almost exhausting at times for the men. And the men were also taught knitting and needlework to keep them occupied, to keep their minds busy. And some of that still survives. So on the left, that's um, a shoe bag that was embroidered by one of the wounded men. Um, and it's uh, believed to show uh, Louisa Garrett Anderson walking to of, um, her, her and Flora's dogs. They had black and white dogs um, like the, the whiskey advert. And the picture on the right of a dovecot um, on the back of that, it says that this was embroidered by Walter Elmy um, with one arm. So he'd had one arm amputated at the hospital. And so that picture was given to the Anderson family and handed down and, and remains in the family still. And in fact, as part of my research, I got in touch with lots of families of soldiers who had been treated at Endell Street. And some of them still have similar embroideries that have been handed down in the family. But despite all these efforts at uh, diversion and at jollity, it was, of course, grueling and exhausting work. On top of the long hours, the women were frequently coming under attack from air raids, from zeppelins and planes dropping bombs. Some of those bombs dropped very close to the hospital including one very large bomb which crashed through an air raid shelter right at the bottom of Endor Street. As the war went on, they were also suffering from food shortages and food rationing. And at the same time, Murray and Anderson were very strict taskmasters. They were strict disciplinarians and hard taskmasters because, of course, they had to be in order to run an efficient military hospital. So many of the staff talked about being in awe of them and even actively afraid of them. One of the orderlies said that they were told to be that they had to be not only as good as men, but better. But even though they did come across as very severe, sometimes quite um, quite austere, they actually did look after their staff as well. So um, there are lots of cases of um, them sending women doctors and other women staff to their weekend cottage. They had a cottage in Buckinghamshire in order to recuperate. Yet even though it was exhausting and grueling, it was also exhilarating work because the women who worked at Andrew Street were having the first, the chance for the first time in their lives for some of them to do something that they were good at, something that they could um, demonstrate their skills uh, to show that they were as good as men. Well, after the war ended, Endel Street remained open for a further year to treat the victims of the 1918 influenza pandemic the so-called Spanish flu. And that, as I'm sure we can all imagine, was really the darkest time for the staff. Because throughout the war, the women had saved thousands of men from death and disability, but they were no match for this invisible enemy, the flu virus. The pandemic caused between 50 million and 100 million deaths worldwide, and at the height of the second, the most lethal wave, which hit uh, this country in November 1918, so the time of the armistice, nearly 30,000 people died in the UK in a single week. And at Endel Street, more patients died per week during the flu pandemic than had died per week in the war. And of course, the virus um, hit staff too. So 22 staff at least became ill with the flu, 
and at least four of the staff died. And this was really, I think, the breaking point for Flora Murray. Um, she had stayed utterly steadfast throughout the war, but when she was told that one of the, the nurses had actually turned the corner and was going to survive, she broke down in tears. But Endel Street also trialled new methods to try to prevent the virus spreading. So they uh, were one of the first military hospitals to trial face masks, which were not in common general use at the time, um, segregated wards and screening the beds. So the doors of Endel Street finally closed in December 1919, just over 100 years ago. And the war had changed everything and nothing because women had won the vote in 1918. The vote was given to women over 30 who fulfilled certain property qualifications. The women at Ender Street had proved that women could run a military hospital just as well as men, and that women doctors, women surgeons, were just as skilled as their male counterparts. And yet all the women doctors at Ender Street, in fact, all of the women staff, were now expected to go back to doing exactly the roles that they had done before. So medical schools, which had only managed to stay open in the war by admitting female students, they now refused to accept women again. And mainstream hospitals, which likewise had only managed to keep going through the war by taking in women doctors to fill the vacancies, they now dismissed those women and they refused to appoint women doctors again. One woman doctor, for example, who was appointed to a junior post at the London hospital, she never started work because the male doctors there threatened to resign if she did. So most of the doctors who had worked at End of Street had to go back to treating only women and children or go abroad to work or retire. And it would be many more decades before women in medicine won equality in law, at least in 1975 with the Sex Discrimination Act. But I'm sure many women doctors um, will agree that there's still a long way to go yet. Well, Flora Murray and Louisa Garrett Anderson continued working in medicine for a few more years. And then their children's hospital were closed for lack of funds and so they retired to the countryside and Flora died in 1923 sadly I think she'd really been worn out and worn down by all her war work she was given a, a military style uniform and the last post was played at her graveside and Louisa lived on alone in the village in Penn in Buckinghamshire for another 20 years she actually worked in a casualty department in the Second World War, but then she died in 1943. And at that point, um, her body was cremated, so um, she was um, her body was not put in the grave with Flora, but her name was added to Flora's gravestone and also an inscription. And the inscription says, so this is despite all the battles, all the ordeals, all the difficulties they had been through. The inscription says, we have been gloriously happy. That always brings a bit of a tear to my eye. So I wrote my book as a, a tribute to all the women who worked at Endor Street, the doctors, the nurses, the orderlies, and all the men who were treated there. And I wrote it to give voice to them, but also because I think it speaks to us today. And when I wrote it, I hadn't realized quite how pertinently it would speak to us today but about the extremes of human endurance, of loss and pain and sacrifice, but also courage, dedication and compassion, and about the simple joy of being alive. So thank you everybody for listening. I hope everybody um, managed to uh, keep up with the technology and um, watch the uh, PowerPoint okay. I'm very happy to answer questions. And of course, if you do want to know more about the hospital and the amazing women who work there and all the um, lots of lovely anecdotes about the men and, and the women there, then please do feel free to buy my book. Thank you.